Anthak Piaqualt. Hello everyone. My name is Benny George and um, first and foremost I'd like to uh, acknowledge the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, Squamish, unceded territories that we stand on, Aitapka, and um, my name is Benny and I come from uh, the Cowichan territory which is on the island, Vancouver Island and um, I'd like to, uh, I am honored and that I get to bless the, um, uh, your day with, uh, with a song, a prayer song, or a song of remembering and um, this song that I share with you comes from the couch and uh, land there and we we use it for our dancing and we use it for ceremony, for blessing, for healing. And the song I will share with you, Haitzapka, thank you all. I just wanna say that, uh, um, take this time to, um, to remember uh, uh, you know what it was like just just a year ago and you know how times are changing right now and um to you know um think about um uh, uh things that you would you would uh like to change and take advantage of uh that re you regret not doing and um that you regret not doing and uh, um how 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 can we um help and, uh, um, and uh, to bring uh, more awareness, and, uh, to spread more love and to, to uh, elevate ourselves and to really take the time to acknowledge uh, Mother Earth, the creator that we stand on. Um, so I thank you all. So remember all your, um, your family cannot visit right now your grandparents to remember to FaceTime and Zoom them as much as you can um, and your kids to hold them tight and keep all your family and friends in your mind and in your heart. Thank you all and this here is our what we call our our remembrance song.
right? Let's go. Hello. Welcome to Surrey Interfaith Council's showing of the World Interfaith Harmony Week event in our neighborhoods. In 2010, Ken Abdullah of Jordan asked the United Nations if they would declare a week during the year as World Interfaith Harmony Week to showcase all of the communities of faith, the people of faith, people of the communities around the world that we are working together, we're learning from each other, we're participating in events that each other holds, and we're working on initiatives to make our communities a better place, serving folks who are in need, which ranges from being unhoused all the way to seniors in the community who need services, uh, making sure that, that uh, where there's a gap and no services, that somehow or other people from the various communities can get together in faith and showcase faith in action. We would like to acknowledge that here in Surrey, White Rock Delta, that we're on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, the Kwantlen, the Cape Sea, the Tawasan, and the Semiami First Nations. So we give thanks for being able to share this incredible space with the First Peoples of the land. We look forward to you having the opportunity to spend an hour or so a day during February 1st to 7th and enjoying the array of different activities, the tour of sacred spaces, the stories of faith, the spoken word and music um, at the end of the, the week and um, along the way other, other activities that have been planned, dialogues and, and um, get together. Unfortunately, as in the last couple of years, we've not been able to meet in person, so we really hope that you will connect with us through our website, through our email, if you're interested in becoming involved. And we look forward with great joy to the day when once again we're able to shake hands and give hugs and speak to each other in person. May you have a wonderful week. Hi, I'm Darrell Walker, Mayor of the City of White Rock. I'd like to begin by recognizing we're standing on the unceded territory of the Semi-Amu First Nation and the broader territory of the Coast Salish people. Today is the first day of World Faith Interfaith Harmony Week. Uh, it, it was uh, set by the United Nations so that we could begin to recognize that what we have in common is far more important than the differences. It's not just about faith, it's about culture and it's about people's beliefs. Here in White Rock, we have an array of different faith-based organizations, as well as cultures and people who believe in different things. That shouldn't divide us, it should make us a stronger community. And so what I wanna to say to you today is, when it comes to it, let's make sure that our differences aren't half as important as our ability to bring people together and celebrate our commonalities. That's what will make us a great community. Thank you. On behalf of International Society for Krishna Consciousness, I express my sincere gratitude for the opportunity to participate in this interfaith conference. International Society for Krishna Consciousness, popularly known as the Hare Krishnas, was founded by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada in the year 1966. Today we have more than 800 centers all around the globe and became a truly united spiritual movement transcending various cultural, racial and geographical boundaries. Although this movement is seen as a section of Hindu religion, it actually tries to revive the original Sanatana Dharma, means eternal religion. The word Hindu was introduced in the recent history. Whereas Hindu religion is portrayed as sectarian, Sanatan Dharma is non-sectarian. The word religion in English means a set of faith. The faith changes depending on time, place and circumstances, but Dharma does not. Dharma actually means an inherent quality of any object. For example, Dharma of fire is to be light and heat. One cannot separate heat and light from fire. Similarly, the Dharma of the eternal spirit soul 
is to serve the supreme spirit eternally service cannot be separated from the soul just as we see that everyone is serving someone else in this material world other than god the goal of any religion is to revive that lost connection and loving service of the spirit soul to the supreme being the core of our philosophy is that god is a person whom we call as krishna others may call him as allah jehova christ etc but all of them refer to the same god a true lover of god will recognize him just as a dog recognizes his master irrespective of his different dresses that he may wear as per our scripture krishna is all attractive and all loving supreme personality of god as a loving father he is longing for our relationship which we have forgotten in this pursuit of enjoying independently of him according to our scripture god is the seed giving father of all living entities aham bija pradapita i am the seed giving father of all living entities krishna says in bhagavad gita 14.4 however forgetting that relationship we are struggling in this material world which is temporary and full of misery how to regain that relationship first step is to realize that we are not this body but a spirit soul part and parcel of the supreme spirit mamai vamsa jeeva loke jeeva bhuta sanatana krishna says that the living entities in this conditioned world are my eternal fragmental parts bhakti yoga the devotional service unto the supreme reconnects us to our supreme father sri krishna this bhakti yoga is non sectarian because it is on the platform of soul which does not have any sectarian designations the only designation that a soul carries is that it is eternally the part and parcel of the supreme being therefore we encourage everyone to take up the process of bhakti yoga which begins with the chanting of the holy name of the lord as enjoined in all scriptures as per vedic scripture the chanting of hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 rama hare rama 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 hare hare is considered the topmost form of deliverance from this miserable material existence one can chant any name of the supreme lord as prescribed in one's own religious scripture to attain the same benefit following our founder acharya spiritual master is divine grace ac bhakti vedanta swami shila prabhu pada our mood is to give the love of god to anyone and everyone without any discrimination and encouraging one to follow the religious principles as given by the authority without any mental speculation or misinterpretations we welcome everyone all heartedly to come and participate in our sunday service at 5:30 pm to learn more about our philosophy and culture at 5462 marine drive burnaby pc thank you hari krishna hi and welcome to northwood united church we're located at 8855156 street in the fleetwood area of surrey and we're glad that you have stopped by on the sacred spaces tour i can't really speak uh, for all christian churches of course because as any faith tradition ours being 2000 years old has evolved and changed over time there are many differences and uh, uh things that um really define our different denominations in the christian church but i'll point you to some of them that are here at northwood and just speak to to those firstly as we gather here in the fleetwood area we acknowledge and we with deep appreciation celebrate the ability to do ministry here on the land that is that of the Kwantlen the Semiamu and the Kitsi communities we honor their land and their heritage and we're 
honored to be here in ministry. Northwood United Church is a somewhat new church in compared to others. Uh, we are an amalgamation of two churches in Surrey, North Surrey United Church and Fleetwood United Church, which is where the name Northwood came from. We united the two churches in 1994 and then began building this present location and began worshiping here in 1998. So we are somewhat new uh, in, in the history of our church, perhaps compared to many other churches. And I guess in many ways that speaks to the, the nature of change and ebbs and flows of churches and of denominations. Our own denomination of the United Church of Canada is really that of an amalgamation here in, in this country in 1925. So we're just about to come up in five years uh, time to, in four years time rather, to the 100th anniversary of our denomination. In 1925, the United Church of Canada was formed by an act of parliament by amalgamating the Presbyter many of the Presbyterian churches, the Methodist churches, and the Congregationalist churches here in Canada into one church called the United Church of Canada. By doing that, we became the largest Protestant church in, uh, in Canada, and we continue to offer ministry in various uh, parts and cities and uh, remote areas and large cities throughout the, the country. At Northwood, there are various entries in which you can come into the church. And the reason I, I note that are that it's very important that we welcome people with the kind of spirit that Jesus welcomed people into faith and into community. Our scriptures talk about Jesus welcoming even the little children who back in his day were not valued as we do today, welcome the little children onto his knee. So we have people stationed at all of our welcome point, at all of our entrances to welcome people into the church. And that's a very important part is that people feel welcome and included as they come and gather and become part of a spiritual family who worships together who learns together and grows together. Following the welcome, as we physically come through the entry, there is a symbolic form of welcome that we also participate here at the church. I'm standing at our baptismal font. And one of the things that we do is we celebrate the welcome that we know that God offers us through Jesus Christ in our baptism. Now this, as you can see, is a fairly small baptism and we baptismal font, and we just have little bits of water that go into the baptismal font. The person would come up, usually in our tradition, children, infants, toddlers come up and are usually held in the minister's arms as the parents or guardians stand beside me, and we welcome the child in baptism, we would be placing a little bit of water uh, on their head as a symbol of new beginning, a symbol of rebirth. There's a theological understanding that we almost die in Christ and are reborn in Christ. We die to our old ways and are reborn in our new. In the United Church, we understand this to be a symbolic act, a symbolic sacrament that, that symbolizes something that has already happened. God's welcome, God's grace, and God's love has already happened, and we celebrate this as a community in which we lift it up together as we're gathered for worship on a Sunday. Now, this font is very small. As you can see, it's quite, quite tiny. Other traditions will, will have a large baptismal font, a, a large where people can actually go inside the, the um, baptismal font and be fully immersed, like larger than a bathtub. And some people will do it outside at a lake or a river or such. But the meaning is similar and uh, shared between our different traditions in those ways. I'm now standing behind our pulpit. This is a lectern, a place in which where uh, people speak from. Of course, the, most people are speaking from the Bible. We would be reading scriptures from the Bible. The Bible is our holy book. It's comprised of 66 
various books that are gathered together, stories that, that gather from the, the Old Testament, which is shared between the three monotheistic traditions of Islam, Judaism, and then, of course, Christianity. And we read uh, these scriptures. Uh, one theologian once said that we read with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. It would not just be the minister that would be at the pulpit. It would also be people from the congregation, uh, lay people that would come up and read scripture and offer, offer reflections and stories and prayers as well. It's very much a shared learning, a shared uh, uh, learning uh, from all of the people as we gather together and together seek to hear God's word that is shared. And so we're here at the pulpit. I, along with many other people, sharing our faith stories and growing together. We next gather behind the table. And a number of things happen here at the table, and I'll just go through them one by one. We gather together and celebrate Holy Communion. And that is a, a ritual, a sacrament that Jesus has taught us. It's one that goes back to the earlier traditions of, of a love feast, a sharing of, of food that all would be gathered in Holy Community. When we gather together, we remember Jesus, one of his last acts on the holy night of Monday, Thursday, the night before uh, his crucifixion in death. And we remember that he wanted all the people to know that he would be with them always. So he took bread, he broke it, and he said to them, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. And he also took a cup poured it out, a cup of wine, and he said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you share in this, remember me. Our various traditions in the Christian church think of this uh, differently. Some people see this as the literal body and blood of Jesus. Others understand this to be as more representational, but all of us really understand this as a sacrament that allows us to feel closer with God through Jesus. It's something that is celebrated together on a weekly basis in some churches and on a monthly basis in others. So it does vary and change, but the common aspect of it bringing us together in holy connection and holy communion with God is remain between all of our traditions as we celebrate holy communion in bread and in juice or wine together. Next is the cross. The cross is a central part of the Christian tradition, of course. You see crosses on many of our churches, on the roof, on the, the walls. Uh, it's uh, on ours as well. Many people have a cross around their neck, and many of our members have crosses tattooed on their bodies. The cross is a very significant part of our faith because it is that central act that Jesus offered that we all find differing understandings of meaning. The cross is that instrument of death that the Romans used to torture people so that they would maintain social order. People were literally nailed to a cross and they would hang on the cross till the point of death. And that would be a warning to others not to rebel against the Roman powers. The cross, you can see, is empty for us. And it's a reminder that while Jesus was crucified on a cross, that he rose on the third day. Some Christians understand a literal meaning of, of Jesus' death and resurrection, literally taking away, taking our sins on, that they would be, be removed from us, and that we would be freed through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Other Christians understand the death and resurrection of Jesus more from an understanding of, of seeing this as the, the ending and the new beginnings that God will continue to bring. But for all Christians, the cross is a central part of our faith, a reminder that death is not the end, and that indeed God brings resurrection, transformation, and hope and light at the end of the journey. Good Friday was the day of Jesus' death, the day after the Holy Supper occurred. And Jesus' death occurred on the Friday, and on the third day, on the Easter sunrise, they found that the tomb was empty and that Jesus had indeed risen. So the cross is a very strong and powerful symbol for our faith. And finally, at the table, you'll see a candle in front of me. 
Candles are lit for a variety of reasons, but the one candle that's on the table is a reminder that Jesus is understood to be the light of the world. Jesus once said that, that the darkness would not put it out. The light continues to shine. And Christians see Jesus to be the light to the nations, offering light for our journey, light in our darkness, hope for the days ahead. When the candle is lit here, it's a reminder that Jesus' presence is with them tangibly in that light. Candles are also lit in many churches as a form of prayer, and we continue to find a depth of meaning through the light. Another thing that happens at the church, and I'm just holding a symbol of it, is fellowship. It's food and fellowship. Holding my coffee mug. And one of the things that we do after we gather in worship is we gather around food and drink. It's important for us to have fellowship because at that time, that's the part where life is shared, where people hug, at least before COVID, and I know after we will one day as well, where people embrace one another, where we share our stories, share food, share life. Fellowship is a very significant part of, of life in the Christian tradition, and we look forward to that time when we can do it once again. So I just lift up that as another important part of our tradition, and probably a part that we all share in all faith traditions as well. Well, I want to thank you for dropping by Northwood. I know we only have a few minutes at each stop, but this virtual tour has provided us an opportunity to share a few of the features of the Christian church and, and really see how some are different and some are similar. As you go forth on your, your next, towards the next stop, I just offer you this blessing. Go forth in the name of God, who created you in abundant love. Go forth in the name of Christ, who defeated death and offers us all new life. Go forth in the name of the Holy Spirit, that blesses us and guides us on the journey. Go forth now and always in peace. Thanks for coming. Welcome to the virtual tour of a Sikh Gurdwara. Gur means moving from darkness to light. Dwar means gateway or entrance. For six, Gurdwara is where we go to move ourselves from places of darkness, challenge, and suffering, and to move into the light and to thrive. Gurdwara can be a brick and mortar building. It can also be in our homes, and it can be in our hearts. The gateway that moves us from darkness to light can be with us wherever we are. When you enter the physical building, the first thing you'll do is take off your shoes and put them away. Then you'll wash your hands. This is not a COVID protocol. It's actually an etiquette we've had for hundreds of years. If you don't have your own head covering, you can get a fresh one and use it to cover your head. There are several beliefs as to why we cover our heads. Some believe that this is their way of signaling that they take full responsibility for where they are currently at figure out what they need to change, and are open mind, body, and soul to make this happen. Others believe it is a cultural practice that shows respect for the sacred space they are in. Still others believe that it's a sign of humbleness and modesty. So, which explanation resonates with you? If you wish, you can go into the Lunger area and have Lunger, a free vegetarian meal. Before COVID, we would sit together in this area and share langar. Now, it is offered as a takeout meal. Langar is cooked by volunteers of all genders and all ages. Usually, we feed hundreds of people a day, as you can see from the size of the pots. The format of langar was developed in the 1500s by Bibi Kivi. She is known in our teachings as the tree that shades humanity. The purpose of langar is twofold. It's an opportunity to break bread as equals with our neighbors from all backgrounds, and it fills our bellies so that we can focus on connecting with source, working on ourselves, or dealing with our challenges. All of those are hard to do when our bellies are empty. The Guru's Darbar is where we come to learn and work on ourselves. When we first enter, six will bow before the City Guru Granth Sahib. 
are living and embodied text that contains our teachings. We bow to the diverse wisdom it contains. Then we go and receive prashad, a sweet that is made out of flour, butter, sugar, and water. When we accept prashad, we renew our commitment to equality of all and acknowledge that we are all connected to the same source. Before COVID, we would then take a seat and listen to learn or commune with source. Now we listen to our teachings as they're streamed online. In recent decades, many Gurdwaras have begun the process of decolonizing. Six are working to reclaim our tradition of having teachers in our Gurdwaras of all genders and ages. Many Gurdwaras are providing opportunities for all to learn our protocols. The practice of sitting according to gender is a holdover from cultural norms in India from many decades ago. Six in India today don't do this. They sit together as families. As we continue to decolonize in Canada, this practice is also being looked at. Our ultimate teacher is the Siri Guru Granth Sahib. It contains over 6,000 stanzas in over 1,400 pages. It has multiple languages. Writers from diverse cultural and faith backgrounds have contributed to it. It is also set to music. This is why Kirtan, devotional singing, is such an important practice for Sikhs. Interfaith harmony, which is really interfaith relationships of mutual respect and cooperation, have been part of Sikhi right from the beginning. Our first Guru, Guru Nanak Dev Ji, and our first Sikh, Bibi Nanki Ji, his sister, developed relationships with neighbors from many faiths. Some of these neighbors were spiritual teachers in their own path, and some of their teachings have been incorporated into the Siri Guru Granth Sahib, the teachings that we six bow to today. Neighbors from different faiths and cultures working together for the well-being of all is a fundamental practice in Sikhi. We call it Sarbatapala. Sikhi is not an organized religion. It's a way of life that is rooted in the beliefs that we are all connected to the same source and each other, that we earn abundant, honest livings and share what we earn, that when the going gets tough, we commit to moving into expansive, thriving resilience. We help and work towards the well-being of all of us. And we are not limited by our DNA or the circumstances of our birth. So I will end this tour with the sick greeting. Vaheguru Jika Khalsa. Hey neighbor, do you remember that your true authentic self is connected to this amazing source that helps us shift from darkness to light. Vaheguru Jiki Fateh. And do you remember that everything you do and don't do is connected with that same source? And since we're all connected to each other and source, how you show up and don't show up impacts us all. Go! Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon you. Allah says in the Holy Quran, I have not created the jinn and men, but that they worship me. For this very purpose, Muslims across the globe build mosques to worship the Almighty. One such example of a mosque is right here behind me the Bath Rahman Mosque in Delta, British Columbia. My name is Lukman Hashmi. Let me take you on a tour of this beautiful mosque. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community are Muslims who believe in the Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, who founded our community in 1889 as a revival movement within Islam. 
Under the leadership of Khilafat, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has built over 16,000 mosques, one such example being Bayt rahman The foundation stone for this mosque was laid in 2005 by Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed, the fifth Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat. After 16 years, the mosque was completed and, in 2013, it was inaugurated by Hazrat Khalifatul Masih the fifth. The word mosque means place of worship. In Arabic, the word mosque is pronounced masjid. It is a place of spiritual development because all activities in a mosque are for the Almighty's sake. Here, there are facilities for spiritual advancement, such as religious classes for both adults and children, and panel discussions tackling contemporary issues. It is also a place where Muslims offer their prayers five times a day. In the early years of Islam, the Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, conducted all public affairs in his mosque. He would meet all delegations, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, in the mosque. When you first arrive at Bayt rahman you will notice the minaret and dome, both of which are plated with reflective aluminum. Historically, the minaret was used to give the azan, the call to prayer. The dome was constructed to help create better acoustics and magnify the sound of the sermon to all who attend it. As you walk inside, you will see the heart of the mosque, the prayer hall. This particular hall can accommodate up to 1,000 people. You will notice the dome allows the hall to fill with natural light. You will also see the beautiful calligraphy. All mosques are designed in such a way that they are always facing the Holy Kaaba. The Bayt rahman Mosque also has a fully functioning gymnasium which is used for sports, but it can also accommodate an additional 900 people. This hall is used for symposiums, banquets, and other special events. In addition, the Bayt rahman Mosque also has a library, daycare center, kitchen, guest accommodations, conference rooms, office space for volunteers, and a fully equipped and fully functional funeral preparation room. Our mosque is open to the public. Over the years, we have entertained students from different schools. We have held multi-faith events and have opened our doors to guests of all denominations and all walks of life. We hope and pray that this pandemic is over sooner than later, so that next year, we can give you this tour in person. So we may talk, share ideas and stories, and my favorite part, so that we may eat together. Thank you, and God bless you. God is our loving Heavenly Father. We are His children, and He loves us. Because He loves us, he has given us this life to come to earth to learn and develop and become more like Him. Because He loves us, He's given us a plan so that we can return and live in His presence one day. In the Holy Scriptures, we see God's love for all His children. We learn in the Bible that God loves us so much that He provided His Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior and Redeemer, and to teach us the correct way to return to God. During His mortal ministry, Jesus Christ taught that the gate to God's kingdom is through the ordinance of baptism by immersion. 
baptism is symbolic of Christ's death and resurrection. When we are baptized, we symbolically put away or lay down our old life and are reborn or have a newness of life. In addition to the ordinance of baptism, God has instructed that his children must receive other ordinances, including those that bind all God's children together for eternity. These sacred ordinances are only performed in holy temples. Unlike our chapels, which are for Sunday worship and open to all, The holy temples are reserved for performance of the most sacred sacraments of our faith. Including the performance of baptism by proxy for deceased ancestors. Thus, God in his infinite wisdom and mercy has prepared a way for all his children to have an opportunity to accept these ordinances if they so choose. Temples have always been a part of God's plan. We can read about temples throughout the sacred recorded history of the Bible. For example, Moses and the children of Israel were commanded to build and carry the tabernacle, a large portable temple. King Solomon was directed to build and dedicate a great temple in Jerusalem. And in the New Testament, Jesus Christ visited the temple and referred to it as his father's house and protected its sanctity when it was violated by money changers. Our message to the world is that God has revealed his truths again to his children on earth. Among those truths, that Jesus Christ had a church in ancient days. That church has been restored again in our day. It's led by living apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. In addition to the message of God's love for all his children, and of the message of the restoration of Christ's ancient church in our day, we also declare that along with the Bible, another ancient witness of Jesus Christ has been given. This witness is known as the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. We invite you to join us for services in one of our chapels and to read the Book of Mormon and find out for yourself if it truly testifies of Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Ismaili Center Vancouver. We hope this mini tour is valuable and educational for those participating in Interfaith Harmony Week. First, a little bit about our community. The Shia Imami Ismaili Muslims, generally known as the Ismailis, belong to the Shia branch, one of the two major branches of Islam. The first Ismailis came to Canada in the late 1960s and early 1970s due to political upheavals in parts of East Africa and the Indian subcontinent. Another wave of settlement came from Afghanistan in the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, having been in Canada for close to 50 years, the community has become known for their ethic of volunteerism, service to society, and support for humanitarian causes. A key aim of the Ismaili Center is to enhance and encourage dialogue and understanding. It is part of an international network of other such centers in London, Lisbon, Dubai, Dushanbe, and Toronto. 
This center was opened in 1985 by His Highness the Aga Khan and Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. It is a representational and ambassadorial building, one that symbolizes Canadian Ismaili Muslim values and the growing understanding of Islam in the West. When you visit the center, the first place that you encounter is the courtyard. There you will find the tulip fountain. In many faiths, water is the symbol of purity and is also the source of life. The concept of layering is also expressed in the courtyard with two sets of trees, walkways, and beautiful landscaping. The front face of the building is made of Carrera marble, Italian sandstone, and concrete. The large portal entrance is an architectural element commonly seen in places of worship in Persia, India, and Central Asia, and it is meant to instill a sense of humility before the Creator. As we move from the courtyard into the building, we enter the loggia or lobby. The building has three floors. This is the main level, with a social hall upstairs and an administrative wing and classrooms downstairs. When the community comes together for prayer, they meet here before they enter the prayer hall. Throughout the building, you will find subtle geometric patterns, stylized calligraphy, and visual cues that speak to the key concepts of light, symmetry, and balance that form the three key architectural concepts of the center. As we make our way to the upstairs social hall, you will notice a uniquely designed staircase consisting of four octagons of concrete, perfectly aligned. This feature was built as a reminder of the minaret seen in some Muslim places of worship. As you walk up, you will notice the tapestries found throughout the building, which are mostly 16th and 17th century Turkish kilns. The social hall is a multifunctional and multi-purpose room. Here we have weddings, dance performances, musical concerts, lectures, fitness classes, as well as high-profile events such as citizenship ceremonies, art exhibits, and meetings of government and civil society organizations. On either side of the room, you will find smaller alcoves or niches, which allow for small groups to meet and for individuals to find a quiet place to sit. We will now make our way down to the lower-level administrative wing to visit the council chambers. The Council Chambers is a room where decisions related to the social governance of the community take place. Here, volunteer leaders use their knowledge, resources and expertise to serve on various boards and portfolios that deliver programming in the areas of health, education, human resources, arts and culture, economic planning and social welfare. These institutions work together to improve the lives of community members. On the far wall is the personal standard of His Highness the Aga Khan, and next to it are numerous plaques and awards that speak to the community's engagement and outreach with the wider society. One such program is called Ismaili Civic, which is a volunteer initiative to improve the quality of life of Canadians. Ismaili Civic was launched in July 2017 to coincide with His Highness's Diamond Jubilee and Canada's 150th year as a nation. The aim was for the community to give 1 million hours of volunteer service to the wider community over a period of one year. This goal was reached within 10 months and the initiative continues to this day. The Smiley Civic has now become a permanent event where the last Sunday of September is known as the Smiley Civic Day. Lastly, one of the most inspiring spaces of the Smiley Center is the immense high-domed prayer hall. While not included in this footage, we would very much like to invite you to see it in person in the not too distant future. This brings us to the end of the virtual mini tour of the Ismaili Centre of Vancouver. We thank you for joining us and wish you a safe and successful Interharmony Week.
for you. Oh, come have a seat. Thank you. Grandma, I found this book when I was cleaning my desk. Is this yours? Oh, yes, it's mine. I read it every morning. Oh. Thank you for returning it. But Grandma, who's Baha'u'llah? Well, you see, throughout the history, God sent down divine educators to the humanity, and they also call the manifestation of God. Well, they provide the basis of the knowledge for the advancement of our civilization. And Baha'u'llah is the most recent one. And us, his followers, were called the Baha'is. Did Baha'u'llah have a mission like the other manifestation of God? Baha'u'llah taught us the importance of oneness of our mankind and the abolition of all prejudice, the equality between men and women, and the importance of the harmony that exists between religion and science. Oh, I totally agree. But Grandma, well, is there any beliefs in the Baha'i community? Baha'is believe that truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtues. It's very important that we do not lie. Oh, but does that mean if I become Baha'i that I can never ever lie? No, we don't do that because Baha'u'llah told us so and we know that's what's right for us. Oh, yeah, I think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Where do Baha'is pray? There are 10 houses of worship all across the world located in Sydney, Australia, Badenbang, Cambodia, Santiago, Chile, Frankfurt, Germany, New Delhi, India, Panama City, Panama, Apia, Samoa, Wilmet, United States, Kampala, Uganda, and North Del Caca, Colombia. Oh, thank you, Grandma. I think I learned a lot today. You're welcome. When people pray, Baha'is believe that anywhere God is mentioned is sacred. <laughs> Thank you. 